Part 1. The Call in the Night The night was eerily quiet when I first heard it, the soft, familiar call of my mother's voice echoing through the darkened hallway. I was nine years old and we had just moved into a new house, the latest stop in our constant moving. Every night I struggled to sleep trying to familiarize myself with the creaks and groans of the old house. But this night was different. The voice calling my name came from the kitchen, clear and gentle. Sweetie, come here, it said. I sat up in bed, rubbing my eyes, and glanced at the clock. It was just past 1 a.m. My mother never called me this late. Still, the voice was so soothing and familiar, so I slipped out of bed and padded down the hallway. The only light in the house came from the kitchen, casting long, creeping shadows. As I passed my siblings' and parents' bedroom doors, the voice called again, more insistent this time. Come to the kitchen, honey. My heart pounded as I approached the kitchen doorway. Just as I was about to step inside, I heard another voice, my mother's voice, but this time it was coming from her bedroom. Go back to bed. I heard it too, she said, her voice trembling with fear. I froze, my blood turning to ice. Two voices identical, one calling me into the kitchen, the other warning me to stay away. I turned to look at my parents' closed bedroom door. Mom, I whispered, my voice barely audible. Go back to bed now, my mother's voice insisted, louder this time, filled with urgency and terror. Terrified, I turned and ran back to my room, my feet barely touching the ground. I dove under my covers, trembling, and waited. I could hear my parents' bedroom door creak open, followed by hurried footsteps and the soft murmur of voices as they checked the house. They found nothing. Lying in bed, I tried to calm my racing heart. My mother's voice had saved me, but from what? I couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister was lurking in our home, something that could mimic my mother's voice perfectly. The house was silent again, but I knew better than to trust it. I clutched my blanket tightly and forced myself to stay awake, dreading what might come next. Part 2. The Warning The next morning, the atmosphere at breakfast was tense. My parents exchanged worried glances, their faces pale and drawn. I could tell they hadn't slept much either. Mom, what was that last night, I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. My mother looked at me, her eyes wide with fear. It was nothing, sweetie. Just a bad dream. I knew she was lying. The urgency in her voice when she told me to go back to bed was too real. My father cleared his throat, trying to sound casual. Yeah, nothing to worry about. Sometimes houses make strange noises. But I wasn't convinced. The voice I heard wasn't a noise. It was my mother's voice, clear and unmistakable. As the day went on, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. That night I lay in bed, wide awake, listening for any sound, any indication that the voice might return. Hours passed, and just as I started to drift off, I heard it again. Sweetie, come here. My heart skipped a beat. I sat up, straining to hear. The voice was softer this time, almost a whisper, but still unmistakably my mother's. I hesitated, glancing towards the hallway. My instincts told me to stay put, but curiosity and fear pulled me towards the door. As I crept down the hallway, the voice grew louder, more insistent. Come to the kitchen, honey. The light was on again casting eerie shadows that danced on the walls. Just as I reached the kitchen doorway, I heard my mother's real voice, this time filled with terror, coming from her bedroom. Stay away from the kitchen. Go back to bed now. I froze, torn between the two voices. The voice from the kitchen was so inviting, so familiar, but the fear in my mother's warning was palpable. I backed away slowly, my eyes fixed on the kitchen door, waiting for something, anything to reveal itself. And then I saw it, a shadow, darker than the others, lurking just beyond the doorway. It moved slowly, deliberately, as if aware of my presence. I felt a cold chill run down my spine, and without thinking I turned and ran back to my room. I dove under the covers, my heart pounding in my chest. I could hear my parents' hurried whispers, the creak of the floorboards as they checked the house again. This time they found nothing, but I knew what I had seen. The next morning my mother sat me down. Her face was pale, her eyes filled with concern. Sweetie, I need you to promise me something, she said, her voice trembling. If you hear my voice calling you in the night, you must come to me first. Do not go to the kitchen. Do you understand? I nodded, fear gripping my heart. But why, Mom? What is it? She took a deep breath, her hands shaking. There's something in this house, something that can mimic our voices. It wants to lure you into the kitchen, but you mustn't go. Promise me you'll stay away. I promise, I whispered the weight of her words sinking in. I realized then that whatever was in our house was more dangerous than I could have imagined. And it was only a matter of time before it would try again.
Part 3. The unseen intruder days turned into nights filled with restless sleep and a growing sense of dread. Every creak of the house, every whisper of wind set my nerves on edge. My mother's warning replayed in my mind constantly, a mantra of survival, do not go to the kitchen. One night as I lay in bed straining to stay awake, I heard something new, a soft rhythmic tapping. It started faintly but grew louder, more insistent. It was coming from the direction of the kitchen. Tap, tap, tap. Curiosity and fear battled within me, but I couldn't resist. I slipped out of bed and tiptoed down the hallway. The house was dark, the only light coming from a sliver under the kitchen door. The tapping continued, steady and deliberate. I reached the door and pressed my ear against it, trying to discern what was making the noise. Tap, tap, tap. It was almost hypnotic, drawing me closer. I placed my hand on the doorknob, hesitating, remembering my mother's warning. But the curiosity was too strong. I had to know. Just as I was about to turn the knob, I heard my mother's voice, this time low and urgent, coming from her bedroom. Go back to bed now. Do not open that door. My hand froze. The voice from the kitchen immediately responded, mimicking my mother's voice perfectly. It's okay, sweetie. You can come in. Panic surged through me. The voice from the kitchen sounded so real, so reassuring. But I knew better. I backed away, my heart racing, and turned to run back to my room. But before I could take more than a few steps, the kitchen door creaked open behind me. I stopped and turned, my eyes wide with fear. The door swung open slowly, revealing nothing but darkness beyond. The tapping had stopped, replaced by an oppressive silence that seemed to fill the house. I took a step back, and that's when I saw Ida shadowy figure standing in the doorway. It was tall and thin, its features obscured by the darkness, but I could feel its eyes on me, cold, unfeeling eyes that seemed to pierce through my soul. I wanted to scream, to call for my parents, but my voice caught in my throat. The figure took a step forward, its movement slow and deliberate. I stumbled back, nearly tripping over my own feet, and then I heard my mother's voice again, filled with desperation. Run! Get out of the house now! That broke the spell! I turned and ran as fast as I could down the hallway, past my siblings' rooms, and into my parents' bedroom. I burst through the door, my breath coming in ragged gasps. My mother was sitting up in bed, her face pale and scared. What happened? she asked, pulling me into her arms. I could barely speak, my heart still racing. There's something in the kitchen I managed to gasp out. It opened the door. My father, already on his feet, grabbed a baseball bat from under the bed. Stay here, he said, his voice steady but his eyes betraying his fear. He left the room, heading towards the kitchen. Minutes felt like hours as we waited, the silence oppressive. Finally, my father returned, his face grim. There's no one there, he said, his voice low. But the door was open. My mother tightened her grip on me, her fear palpable. We need to leave, she said. We can't stay here. My father nodded, his expression resolute. We'll pack up in the morning. For now, let's all stay in here together. We huddled together in my parents' bed, the fear and tension making it impossible to sleep. I lay there, my eyes wide open, listening for any sign of the intruder, but the house remained silent, the darkness oppressive. I knew deep down that whatever was in our house wasn't going to let us go easily, and as the night dragged on, I realized that this was just the beginning. Part 4. The Escape Plan The first light of dawn brought a semblance of safety, but the dread lingered. We packed hastily, each of us casting anxious glances toward the kitchen. My father tried to keep a brave face but his hands shook as he stuffed clothes into a bag. My mother, pale and drawn, kept urging us to hurry. Well, go to Aunt Karen's, she said, her voice tight. Well, be safe there. Just as we were finishing up, a loud crash echoed from the kitchen. We froze, staring at each other in terror. My father grabbed the baseball bat again, motioning for us to stay back. He edged towards the kitchen, his knuckles white from gripping the bat so tightly. I stood with my mother and siblings, our bags at our feet, hearts pounding. The silence was deafening. Then my father called out, his voice shaky but determined. Come in here, quickly. We rushed to the kitchen and what we saw made our blood run cold. The table and chairs were overturned and the cabinet doors were flung open, their contents scattered across the floor. But the most chilling sight was the back door. It was wide open, the morning light spilling in. We need to leave now, my father said, his voice urgent. We didn't need to be told twice. We grabbed our bags and bolted for the car. As we piled in, I glanced back at the house. For a moment, I thought I saw a shadowy figure watching us from the doorway. But when I blinked, it was gone. The drive to Aunt Karen's was tense. My parents exchanged worried glances, and my mother kept looking over her shoulder, 
as if expecting to see something following us. I huddled with my siblings in the back seat, the fear a tangible presence between us. When we finally arrived, Aunt Karen was waiting for us on the porch, her face etched with concern. What happened? she asked as we hurried inside. My mother shook her head, her eyes filled with tears. I don't know how to explain it. There's something in our house, something dangerous. Aunt Karen listened, her expression grim. You can stay here as long as you need, she said. Well, figure this out. For the first time in days, I felt a glimmer of hope. Aunt Karen's house was warm and welcoming, a stark contrast to the oppressive fear that had taken hold of our home. We settled in, trying to shake off the lingering dread. But that night, as I lay in bed, I couldn't sleep. My mind kept replaying the events of the past few days, the voices, the shadowy figure, the open door. I knew that whatever it was, it wasn't finished with us. Around midnight, I heard it again, the soft, familiar call of my mother's voice. Sweetie, come here. My heart pounded. I knew it couldn't be my real mother. She was asleep in the next room. I slipped out of bed and crept to the door, pressing my ear against it. The voice came again, more insistent. Come to the kitchen, honey. I took a deep breath and opened the door just a crack, peeking out into the hallway. It was empty, but the voice continued, calling me to the kitchen. I knew I should stay put, but curiosity and fear propelled me forward. I crept down the hallway, each step filled with trepidation. The kitchen light was on, casting long shadows on the walls. As I approached, the voice grew softer, almost a whisper. Come closer, sweetie. I reached the kitchen doorway and peeked inside. The room was empty, but the back door was open again, the cool night air seeping in. My heart raced as I stepped inside, glancing around. Hello? I called out, my voice shaking. There was no response, only the gentle rustling of the wind through the open door. I took a step forward, and then I saw Ida's shadowy figure standing just beyond the doorway, its eyes glowing faintly in the darkness. Fear surged through me, and I turned to run. But the figure moved faster than I thought possible. It was suddenly in front of me, blocking my path. I stumbled back, my breath coming in short, panicked gasps. Go back to bed, the figure whispered, its voice a chilling mimicry of my mother's. You're not safe here. I backed away, my eyes wide with terror. The figure advanced, its form shifting and flickering in the dim light. Leave us alone, I cried, my voice breaking. And then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the figure vanished, leaving me alone in the silent kitchen. I stood there, shaking, trying to catch my breath. I knew then that running wouldn't save us. Whatever this thing was, it would follow us wherever we went. I turned and ran back to my room, determined to tell my parents in the morning. We couldn't keep running. We had to find a way to stop it, once and for all. Part 5. Confronting the Darkness Morning came, and with it a heavy sense of urgency. I told my parents about the shadowy figure and the voice calling me in the night. My mother's face grew pale, and my father's jaw tightened with resolve. Aunt Karen listened quietly, her expression serious. We can't keep running, my father said, echoing my thoughts. We need to confront whatever this is. Aunt Karen nodded. I might know someone who can help. A friend of mine, Mr. Thorne, deals with unusual occurrences. He might know what we're dealing with. Desperation drove us to agree. Aunt Karen called Mr. Thorne, explaining our situation in hushed tones. He agreed to meet us that evening. The day passed in a blur of anxiety and fear, every shadow seeming to hold a threat. Mr. Thorne arrived at dusk, a tall, imposing figure with piercing blue eyes that seemed to see right through you. He listened intently as we recounted our experiences, nodding thoughtfully. It sounds like you're dealing with a doppelganger, he said finally, his voice deep and calm. These entities can mimic voices and appearances to lure their victims. They thrive on fear and chaos. How do we stop it? My father asked, his voice strained. Mr. Thorne's expression was grave. Confronting a doppelganger is dangerous, but it's not impossible. We need to perform a ritual to banish it. It must be done at the site of its strongest manifestation in your case, the kitchen. My mother's hand tightened around mine. Will it be safe? Mr. Thorne shook his head. There's no guarantee, but it's the only way to end this. Determined, we agreed. That night, armed with candles, salt, and other ritualistic items, we returned to our house. The air was thick with tension as we entered, the familiar sense of dread settling over us. The kitchen was dark, the air unnaturally cold. Mr. Thorne set up the ritual, instructing us to form a circle around the kitchen. He lit the candles, their flickering light casting eerie shadows on the walls. Whatever happens, stay within the circle, he warned, 
Do not break the connection. We joined hands, our grip tight with fear. Mr. Thorne began to chant in a low, rhythmic voice the words, strange and ancient. The air grew colder and the shadows seemed to deepen, pressing in on us. Suddenly the candles flickered violently and the familiar voice called out, Sweetie, come here. I glanced at my mother, her face pale and determined. Stay strong, she whispered. The voice grew louder, more insistent. Come to the kitchen, honey. The shadows in the room began to coalesce, forming into the tall, thin figure I had seen before. Its eyes glowed with a malevolent light, and it spoke again, the voice a chilling mimicry. You can't escape me. Mr. Thorne's chanting grew louder, his voice commanding. The figure hissed, its form flickering. You don't belong here, Mr. Thorne intoned, his voice ringing with authority. Return to the darkness from whence you came. The figure snarled, lunging at us, but it was stopped by the circle of salt. It recoiled, its form flickering wildly. You will never be rid of me, it spat, its voice distorting. Mr. Thorne's chant reached a crescendo, and he threw a handful of salt at the figure. With a final ear-piercing scream, the doppelganger disintegrated, its form dissolving into the shadows. The room fell silent, the oppressive weight lifting. We stood there, breathing heavily, the reality of what had just happened slowly sinking in. Mr. Thorne extinguished the candles, his face etched with exhaustion but relief. It's over, he said quietly. The doppelganger is banished. It can't harm you any more. Relief washed over us, mingled with exhaustion and disbelief. We thanked Mr. Thorne profusely, and he left, urging us to stay vigilant and to cleanse the house regularly with salt and sage. That night, for the first time in what felt like forever, we slept peacefully. The house was quiet, the shadows just shadows. The terror that had haunted us was finally gone. But as I lay in bed, I couldn't shake the feeling that this wasn't truly the end. The memory of the doppelganger's eyes lingered, a reminder of the darkness that lurked just beyond the edge of our reality. Part 6. The Final Encounter Weeks passed and life slowly returned to normal. The house felt lighter, the oppressive fear replaced by cautious hope. We settled back into our routines, but the memory of the doppelganger lingered, a shadow in the back of our minds. One night as I lay in bed, I heard a faint whisper. It was so soft I almost thought I imagined it. But then I heard it again, clearer this time. Sweetie, come here. I sat up, my heart racing. It couldn't be. The doppelganger was gone. Mr. Thorne had banished it. But the voice was unmistakable. I glanced at the clock 1 a.m., the same time as before. Swallowing my fear, I got out of bed and crept down the hallway. The house was dark and silent, the familiar shadows looming large. I reached the kitchen doorway, and to my horror the light was on, casting eerie shadows on the walls. I hesitated, remembering my mother's warning and Mr. Thorne's instructions. But the voice called again, insistent and familiar. Come to the kitchen, honey. Taking a deep breath, I stepped into the kitchen. The room was empty, but the back door was open, the night air cold and sharp. I could feel my pulse quickening, my breath coming in shallow gasps. Then, from the darkness beyond the door, a figure stepped into the light. It was tall and thin, its eyes glowing with a malevolent light. It was the doppelganger, but something was different. It looked weaker, less substantial. You can't escape me, it hissed, its voice a distorted mimicry of my mother's. I stepped back, my fear turning to resolve. You're not real, I said, my voice steady. You don't belong here. The doppelganger snarled, its form flickering. You think you can banish me? I am part of you now. I shook my head, remembering Mr. Thorne's words. You're just a shadow. You have no power here. The doppelganger lunged at me, but it was stopped by an invisible barrier. It screamed in frustration, its form disintegrating before my eyes. This isn't over, it spat, its voice fading. I will return. And then with a final ear-piercing scream, the doppelganger vanished, leaving me alone in the silent kitchen. I stood there shaking, trying to catch my breath. The next morning, I told my parents what had happened. My mother's face was pale, her eyes filled with concern. We need to call Mr. Thorne, she said. Mr. Thorne arrived later that day, his expression serious. A doppelganger can be persistent, he explained. It may try to return, but it's weaker now. We need to strengthen the protections around your home. Together we performed another ritual, reinforcing the salt barriers and cleansing the house with sage. Mr. Thorne taught us how to maintain the protections ourselves, urging us to stay vigilant. Days turned into weeks, and the house remained quiet. The doppelganger's presence was gone, but the memory of it lingered, a reminder of the darkness that had once threatened to consume us. As time passed, we grew stronger. 
Our bond as a family deepened by the shared ordeal. We learned to live without fear, knowing that we had the strength to confront whatever darkness might come our way. And though the doppelganger's final words echoed in my mind, a reminder that the battle was not truly over, I knew we were ready. We had faced the darkness and emerged stronger. Whatever came next, we would face it together. Part 7. The Return of the Shadow Months passed and the sense of normalcy returned to our lives. The house was filled with laughter and light again, and the fear that had once gripped us began to fade. We followed Mr. Thorne's instructions diligently, maintaining the protective barriers and cleansing rituals. For a while it seemed as though we had truly banished the darkness. But one evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, a chill settled over the house. I was in the living room reading a book, when I felt it a familiar oppressive presence. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, and I glanced around, the shadows in the room seeming to grow darker. I tried to dismiss it as my imagination, a residual fear from our ordeal, but then I heard Ida faint, almost imperceptible whisper, Sweetie, come here. My heart skipped a beat. I stood up, my book forgotten, and walked slowly towards the kitchen. The light was off, but the door was slightly ajar, and beyond it the darkness seemed to pulse with a life of its own. I took a deep breath and stepped into the kitchen. The air was cold, the kind of chill that sinks into your bones. I felt the presence stronger now, the shadows swirling around me. The back door was open again, and the night beyond was an impenetrable black. Suddenly the door slammed shut behind me, and I spun around, my heart pounding. The figure was there, standing in the corner, its eyes glowing with malevolence. This time it was more solid, more real than ever before. You thought you could get rid of me, it hissed, its voice a twisted parody of my mother's. But I am eternal. I will always return. I took a step back, my mind racing. I remembered Mr. Thorne's words about the doppelganger's persistence. You have no power here, I said, my voice shaking but defiant. This is our home. The doppelganger laughed, a chilling hollow sound. Your feeble rituals can't stop me. I feed on your fear and you've given me plenty. Summoning all my courage, I reached for the salt container on the counter and began to draw a protective circle around myself. The doppelganger lunged, but it recoiled as it hit the invisible barrier, snarling in frustration. You can't stay in that circle forever, it spat, its form flickering. As I continued the circle, I remembered the words of the banishment ritual Mr. Thorne had taught us. I began to chant, my voice growing stronger with each word. You are not welcome here. Return to the shadows from which you came. The doppelganger screamed, a sound that seemed to pierce through my very soul. It writhed and twisted, its form becoming less substantial with each passing moment. This isn't over, it hissed, its voice fading. I will return. With a final ear-piercing scream, the doppelganger disintegrated, leaving only the oppressive silence behind. I stood there panting, my heart racing, but I knew it wasn't truly gone. It would come back, as it always did. Determined not to let fear control us, we decided to call Mr. Thorne again. He arrived quickly, his expression grim as he listened to my account of the encounter. Doppelgangers are notoriously difficult to banish permanently, he said, but we can weaken it further. Together we performed a more powerful ritual one that required the combined strength of our family. We created a stronger protective barrier, one that would hold even against the persistent darkness of the doppelganger. Days turned into weeks, and the house remained calm. We continued our rituals, our family united in our determination to keep the darkness at bay. The memory of the doppelganger lingered, a reminder of the battle we had fought and the strength we had gained. And though we knew it might return, we were ready. We had faced the shadow and emerged stronger, our bond as a family unbreakable. Whatever came next, we would face it together, without fear. The doppelganger might return, but so would our resolve. 